Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to give this is our um, presentation on um, 3D printing about rocketry. And um, we have a huge turnout, so thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. And um, I think this should be pretty good. Now, I'm going to present this in full screen mode, and I won't be able to see your comments or your chat as we do this, but please talk among yourselves. Um, and I will try to go through the material and try to get us to stop a few minutes early so we can go through some questions at the end. So let me go get started. So um, I think 3D printing is now going to create us a revolution in amateur rocketry. And it's creating a revolution in many fields, but also in professional rocketry. So let's look at what we're doing here. I'm Ken Viva, and uh, at my age, uh, in the 50s and 60s, I wanted to be an astronaut. But uh, sadly, I was not a fighter pilot, so my robots need to end up exploring for me. And I ended up being a physicist and a computer scientist and an entrepreneur, startup guy in Silicon Valley. And my particular expertise is in wireless networking, and particularly with Wi-Fi, cable modems, and computer security. And in Rocketry, I've been now doing it for about 30 years since I had to escape from conference rooms to actually build something with my hands. I'm a ham, I'm a TRA, NAR level three, TAP. Sits on various boards, I've held altitude records, and I put my own PicoSat into orbit a few years back. And I've been mentoring adults and students now for uh, over 20 years. My point of view is, is that 3D printing is already happening. Many of our children and grandchildren already have access to 3D printing, and I find that all my TARC teams have access to 3D printing, and of course, really all our university teams. It fundamentally changes how we build and buy things, because now we have a great flexibility in what we do. And as we all know that have built software or we watch SpaceX, rapid prototyping is a good thing. We get to try something out, see if it works, iterate. And 3D printing enables that to, us to do that with physical things, not just software. And I have a, a personal opinion that we generally tend to overbuild our amateur rockets because of the largely materials we have. Uh, fiberglass and carbon fiber are many times way too strong. And in fact, if we can build it ourselves, designing structures, we can actually more custom design and appropriately design what our systems are. 3D printing today works for many amateur rocketry components, and we'll, I'll talk about my experience. And I think for those of you who haven't done it, I would suggest that you surrender to the inevitable and to embrace and extend. Um, and for the kids coming up, the days of balsa, balsa wood fins is kind of old. So some 3D pretty basics. The first thing to start out with, there's a whole bunch of range of materials, and we can look at the materials that we print with on the base of rigidity, axial strength along the thrust axis. And I like to think of also about flexibility and impact resistance, so they have robustness on landing. Second piece is glass transition temperature. When will they melt? And in particular, not so much melt, but when does heat deformation begins, or begin to see some maybe some structural failure? This comes all to our materials fluctuation, and we'll talk about that. And much of the strength of our designs can be tuned with something called slicing parameters, which is a process by we take, take a 3D object and turn it into printer instructions. And along the way, say, well, how do we fill up solid parts? We fill it up completely, partially what the structure of that is. And that, a lot of that gives us the strength of our, strength of our parts. My 3D printing experience. Uh, I would call myself an advanced newbie. I've been doing this now for a year. Though in COVID times, that tends to be an intense experience. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but I am a very experienced amateur rocketeer. So I built a lot of big, fast, and my particular fascination is with minimum diameter, altitude, and speed. So I started with a low cost printer. This is a printer that you can probably buy on Amazon for a few hundred dollars. I found it to be too much work. 
And the printer became the hobby rather than the tool, leveling the bed, fixing the parts, downloading new DIY software. It never gave me the kind of results that I really wanted. So I donated it away and instead got a thoughtless printer that worked out of the box. Um, and because of its advanced features, actually prints much stronger materials. And then I have a gracious spouse. Um, this is my, we'll talk about this, but one of the dangers of 3D printing is it becomes addictive and all of a sudden you can build more rockets than you can ever possibly fly. So we have a 3D printing explosion right now in rocketry. In commercial liquid fuel motors, here's Rocket Lab's um, Rutherford uh, liquid fuel, um, Carolox motor, 3D printed. We have entire orbital class rockets, Relativity Space's Terran 1. This is their large 3D printer. They've only raised $700 million, so I think someone takes them seriously. Uh, you can build amateur nose cones of basically every size. Up to This is from 38 millimeter up to 150 millimeter that I printed on my printer. This is all happens to be in PET-G. You can print them in shapes, so you can essentially pick the optimal shape that works for your mission. You can print fin cans with as many fins or as few fins in which shape you want. You can print centering rings, bulkheads, transitions, retainers, rail guides. My favorite is the one in the bottom right, which is my flyaway rail launcher for minimum diameters. You can build extreme performance airframes. Now, this is my one that I've yet to fly, but it's a 54 millimeter test bed to try to go a little bit past Mach 2. We'll talk a little bit more about them. And you can build crazy things. Like, who knew I wanted four different Mars landers in all sizes? So the core technology we're using is something called fused deposition modeling, um, printing, in which we build layers of extruded thermoplastic. Uh, you can see the bed going in Z direction as the print each layer going in XY by the print head. Printers that precisely squirt a melted plastic at between two to 300 degrees C at a resolution of about 500ths of a millimeter and a nozzle diameter of 0.4. You could probably get feature sizes on the order of half a millimeter. And you can have a wide choice of materials. And a whole set of rather mature now software workflow tools that go from the design stage to the printing stage. So you end up with a complete model that I never would have been able to build without 3D printing. It was a revolution in materials. You know, when I first got into 3D printing, I thought, well, there's only this soft, br this brittle stuff called PLA, which is kind of brittle, it does, melts very easily. Plastic. Well, then there's your not so much plastic. Particularly the ones I have a favorite with is uh, PETG and nylon. These two really two things. They dramatically raise the temperature in which they begin to deform. And secondly, they dramatically increase strength. And for many of our projects, I think up through level two rockets, these kind of materials are gonna be just fine. You can go one step further. You can begin to impregnate these materials, particularly again, PETG and nylon, with carbon fiber and fiberglass. And even go one step further, to impregnate them with continuous carbon fiber and fiberglass. And we now have printers that are accessible to be able to print that, who are asserted, though I have not tested it, to be as strong as aluminum. We can then impregnate these fibers also with materials for aesthetics, wood, metal, colors, fluorescence. So we now, and flexibility. So here's a material called TPU in which you can make gaskets and shock mounts, flexible. Now, one of the pieces that really got my imagination working was when I was working with some colleagues and we built uh, a satellite to go into orbit. And that satellite is in this bottom left here, that little tube. And it went in orbit to test you doing um, telemetry, lower telemetry at 900 megahertz from low Earth orbit. That satellite plus the carrier satellite below it we're all printed in something called wind form, which is a laser centered version of, of uh, carbon fiber that is space capable. And so it passes all the tests and in fact flies great in space. So for rocketry more closer to the earth, 
we're looking for something that is strong plus flexible and impact resistant and then temperature resistant so it can be used for motor mounts for motor retention for um, nose cone tips for the leading edge of fins so I particularly like pet G and nylon and they have heat deformation temperatures pet G is kind of on the order of 100 degrees C and nylon is on the order of 150 degrees C those are both equal to or higher than the heat deformation temperature of the epoxy resins we use in our composites so if it will fly on fiberglass and the heat doesn't affect it we can probably fly pet G and nylon what are the limits of doing it well for smaller rockets like low power stuff um, it's heavier than balsa wooden paper and so either won't go as high or you need to use some paper for body tubes use it for parts of the rocket but for more complex projects I'm finding it to be lighter than fiberglass I can make the strength happen in different ways than I would with just the solid part of the fiberglass limits on size essentially I'm limited by the size of the print volume of my printer now larger objects I can decompose into pieces and build a larger object out of components but you're still seeing limited so size of your print volume is a big deal on your printer only more exotic things like carbon fiber uh, continuous fiber nylon impregnated continuous fiber carbon fiber is alleged to be as strong as aluminum but I'm finding that my favorite for things up to about level two rockets and things like level three avionics based pet G is way good enough and again for temperature resistance I'm thinking we're in a good place now I need to test these things and I've got a plan we'll talk about later for testing these at supersonic speeds the last downside is that the printer if you're making a complex object say like a 54 millimeter fin cam it will take a lot it will take a day to print that but on the other hand you can then fix it and print it in another day and you can iterate this much faster than you could ever construct one so the workflow you start with a system design using our classic tools you then break that into component design looking at how you design your nose cone how you design your fin can motor retention recovery retention avionics space take each of those individual components put it through a process called slicing which essentially I think of it very much like you use a compiler that converts us from the 3d shape of the object into the instructions for the printer and then iterate and continue doing this until you uh, are satisfied or need to add new features for system design simulations the same thing we always use open rocket rock sim or RAS Aero. I happen to use open rocket a lot except when I need to do very high performance and then I'd use a combination of RAS Aero for its drag estimates input into rock sim pro but as I'm intrigued about the future when we can use a tool a little more advanced tool like fusion 360 to do system design we can output from that in directly into something called sim scale which can do a computational fluid dynamics modeling to give us very good drag model and performance and this is accessible to amateurs so it's a leading edge of my learning curve but I think it's going to be an interesting place where the hobby is going and our students that we mentor in certainly at university are going to be doing this naturally right now component design we create the shapes so we start I find I go to a library online called Thingiverse Thingiverse.com will become your new friend if you're looking at 3D printing. And it's a great source of initial ideas. So here's a model of someone designed this. I think it's a very elegant little um, small rocket. It it's, runs on 13 millimeter motors. There are versions on 18 millimeter motors as well. Um, and you then take that and say, well, I really don't like the nose cone, and I'd really like a different nose cone. So here I've designed a high performance transonic nose cone for this little 13 millimeter motor uh, this happens to be in a tool run in open library that I got off Thingiverse that designs nose cones you run it in a tool called open SCAD you can design just about any nose cone you can imagine I then import it into a tool called Tinkercad which is a simplified 3d design program you can see I brought in the new, new nose cone with the old parts of the other rocket 
I can now design kind of you saw on the back a new payload bay. So now I have the ability to essentially output then an STL design file to take to my slicer. And that design file creates the shape designs to printer instructions. And here you see a simulation of the printer working, layering each horizontal layer going through the Z direction to essentially make a composite file. So you get out this G code file, which goes to your printer. And I happen to like simplify 3D as my slicer. Printers, you have a wide range of capabilities and prices. You can begin with kind of an entry level printer as I did, the Creality Ender 3. Um, and you can perhaps choose to this move up to as I did. I really like my Dremel 3D45. It's kind of pricey, but on the other hand, it's thoughtless. Um, it is uh, it has a heated bed. It has um, a sealed compartment with ventilation so that I don't get any weird smells and sounds in my house. Or you can even go up to this high end, which my colleague John Coker just got, which is the Mark Forged, that'll print nylon plus continuous CF. I think the desirable rocketry features are the ability to pr uh, print these more advanced materials, particularly PETG and nylon. That requires a nozzle temperature, which is actually the tip of the extruder, in which you push through the thermoplastic of about 300 degrees C, a heated printing bed that goes up to about 100 degrees C, and an enclosed build chamber that kind of keeps the temperature better and helps with uh, fumes and sound. Like many things, print volume, more is better. Um, the larger you, you have a print volume, the larger things you can build. I like the feature of mine, has a self-leveling print bed. It kind of automatically adjusts itself so it's flat. If it's not flat, you'll get a bad print, so you have to either manually level it or self-level it. I strongly urge the self-leveling. And lastly, my printer has the feature that it's on the internet, has its own web page, and people I work with, students, colleagues, they can submit jobs to my printer and have it print on my printer. And so my my printer now becomes an asset for my community. Consumables. Basic consumable is, caught, is filament, which comes in half kilogram to one kilogram rolls, varies, the cost varies by material, it's something on the order of 20 to $50 a roll. You can think about a figure of merit about two cents a gram for translucent PET G. With 400, maybe 440 to 100 grams, you can build a small LPR rocket like the 13 millimeter rocket we saw before down on the bottom there. And that's about $2 for the entire airframe. Or you can build um, a 15.4 millimeter high performance power series nose cone like the one you see in um, the translucent that G there for about $2. Or on the airframe, you see kind of on the side there, you'll see the fin can at the bottom. That's also an, a black PET G, uh, also for about $2. So let's look at some examples of what you can build. This is that example of a low power payload carrier. I took the example off of Thingiverse, I then modified it to add a payload bay so I could, for with my students, I could put a Jolly Logic instrumentation so they could actually see what the instrument of flight looked like. I modified it to fly off a micro rail in addition to a rod launch. And it goes to about 100 feet on an A-10 and it costs a buck an airframe. And the 18 millimeter version then goes to about 1,000 feet on a C-6 and three bucks for the entire airframe. This great model of the uh, Luna spaceship by Jamie Clay, available on Thingiverse. Um, I printed this in PLA Plus. It's a strong version of PLA, kind of like ABS, but without the toxic features. 18 millimeter motor mount, fly off a micro, micro rail or a rod. In this case, the rail buttons are embedded into the, uh, into the structure of the um, rocket. I like lunar landers, you know, but they always seem to be a lot of work, you know, and they seem to be fat, fragile. Then I found this one with a 24 millimeter motor mount on Thingiverse. I then customized it for rail launch, rail launch rather than rod. I fixed up the recovery. I put in avionics. I beefed up the landing suspension so it's spring loaded. 
And uh, I added on screw-on uh, motor retainers, all of which are printed as part of the process. And of course, once you have one, then you need more. So I went crazy and built them in a bunch of sizes. Um, for those of you who know a bit about me, I'm very much into Arliss and what we do with satellites. And the core of Arliss was the invention of CANSATs and then ultimately CubeSats. But the new standard is what are now called pocket cubes, which are essentially one eighth of a CANSAT, pardon me, a CubeSat. So they're about five centimeters on a side. And so you can fit eight in the space you put a CubeSat, and you can put three in the space you'd put a CANSAT. Uh, come to my RLS presentation tomorrow, and we'll talk more about this. But these little guy, this little guy here has LoRa telemetry at, uh, in this case, 433 megahertz, which could go to orbit. It has a 120 megahertz arm running in C++ or Python, and more sensors than you know what to do with, you know, nine, you know, nine position GPS measuring uh, ozone, pollution, gamma ray spectrometer, visible light spectrometer, aerosol spectrometer, as usual, as pressure, humidity. And you can now 3D print payload carriers that'll fly in the park to 1,000 feet, or you can package them up a bunch of them and fly them to 150K feet. Or since pocket cubes are now been deployed to orbit, you can now print it in wind form and put it to LEO. This is the uh, Rocket Labs Electron, and last November it put up a pocket cube done by this Spanish high school team. You can see the team lead there holding their pocket cube. And they also demonstrated putting up LoRa telemetry from LEO orbit. So with one kind of design cycle, we can build little satellites that can fly in a park, that can do missions during an altitude column, that basically with the same electronics and a variation on the packaging, we can now send to orbit. So you can build a payload carrier. So I wanted to build an optimal payload carrier that could fly on small motors. So I designed this. Now, building this without 3D printing is hard. How do you design all this piece? So what do we have? This is the, designed it for minimal subsonic drag for max altitude with little, minimal pellet, which means it's cheap. It's cheap to build because 3D printing is cheap, and it's cheap to fly because the motors are much smaller. And so it flies S4 satellites. It has, based on a fiberglass body, flying Altus Metrum, uh, Easy Mini Avionics, and then a bunch of 3D printed parts for the nose cone, payload, the flyaway launch system, the fin can, the recovery anchor, and the motor retainer. And that flyaway launch system works really well. So once you have one at 29 millimeters flying one pocket cube, you then go crazy because it just means you can now easily build more stuff. So now you upgrade it to fly three pocket cubes. You upgrade it to slice down to 24 millimeter motors. You upgrade to a 54 millimeter motor and fly one pocket cube to 10,000 feet on a K. Or you upgrade to three uh, pocket cubes and fly them to 10K. Or you, uh, uh, this, I got this model off of Thingiverse of a 145th scale. Falcon 9, I modified it so it's flyable. And it turns out that the payload fairing is just the right size to hold S4 pocket cubes, and it flies on a 29 millimeter motor. This is the classic Arliss rockets that are three inch fly. These used to take one can set, and they now can take three pocket cubes to about 10K. And this is the classic six inch Arliss M flying on an M1419 to about 10K. It flew one one big uh, payload that now can fit 24 pocket cubes in a, po in a 3D printed deployer. So you could now build 54 million minimum diameter. In this case, it's fiberglass tubing with PET-G components of the nose cone, avionics, recovery anchor, and I didn't show the flyaway launch system here. It sims out to about 20, a little over 20K on an L motor, and should go to about 2.3 Mach. 
I've added an instrumentation on the nose cone, so we're going to measure the, uh, the temperature and the pressure at the tip of the nose cone to kind of correlate that to CFD. And then this goes back to the previous picture. I decided I knew this collection of rockets. Why is not the right question, but it's about all at about 150th scale. So we have here the Luna, which is, if you see a motor mount size, that's because it's intended to fly. So Luna, this is Ariane 5. This is the Saturn V flying on a 24 millimeter motor. This is India's GSLV. This is a Falcon 9 version scaled on an 18 millimeter motor. This is a Soyuz. I was surprised how small the Soyuz is. Uh, space Starship, space, space, SpaceX Starship. ULA's Vulcan, Blue Origin's New Glenn. Look how small the electron is. You know, that's an orbit class rocket. Uh, NASA's SLS, a Mercury Atlas flying on a 13 millimeter motor, a flying N1, um, and a, a Mercury Redstone. So, of course, now you need to build a launch rail as well. So, you need core metal parts of the, in this case, 8020 1010 rail which is exactly TARC size, by the way, and I've got several of my TARC teams flying off this system. I've added in a small 1010 micro wheel maker beam so it can fly small rockets. Uh, it all fights off an Amazon speaker stand, which is $25. And then 3D printed parts for the rail attachments, for the adjustable feet so you can adjust the direction, a bubble level holder so you know where you're pointing it, a wireless launch controller, which is still in the works at Raspberry Pi based, and then a GoPro camera holder. So what are my next steps? I need to fly all this stuff because, you know, I built all this really recently and it needs to be flown. I want to experimentally determine the edges of rocketry 3D printing. I want to fly it, fly it as fast as I can. I want to look at what new materials we have. I really fond right now of PETG and nylon. And I'm interested in now looking at the both carbon fiber for fins and uh, fiberglass for nose cones, impregnated versions of those to really put them into very high performance airframes, particularly for strength, temperature resistance. Want to compare those to conventional parts. I'm going to do this in a set of flight measurements. You saw that 54 millimeter airframe, and that's going to be the basis of a test bed to push the edges of this, at least through Mach 2. And then with my colleague, John Coker, We'll be doing also some of that in the lab to experimentally determine the strength and temperature resistance compared to um, standard construction. So is this the new standard? Well, you know, for low power rocketry, you can build complete low cost airframes for a couple of bucks that students can customize and they can make their own customized versions because frankly, they all know how to do this now. For mid power rocketry, I think all the key structural parts minus the airframe tubing because the the diff, the performance loss of airframe tubing at this size for 3D printing it I think is not a good thing. I know I'm mentoring what four TARC teams and all of them are doing some or all some parts in 3D printing for high power. I think it depends on the power. Or up to K, I think of lots of parts. I think nose cones, fin cans, recovery, avionics sleds. For very high power, like say our Arliss, two stage Arliss Extreme, which is a small O, um, avionics and recovery parts are what we do now. Though we're very intrigued about the ability to think about building fin cans out of nylon impregnated carbon fiber. Uh, carbon fiber impregnated nylon that essentially replaces aluminum, but much easier. So those are things to be looked at. Now, the key issue there is large print volume, because a lot of the value here comes from it being building an integrated part rather than a construction of separate parts glued together. So some resources, you know, your usual things for system design. Um, I recommend to all my teams right now uh, that they use Open Rocket and I, for the places where we really need to get good drag estimates to add in RAS Arrow. Um, component design, I use Tinkercad because I'm stupid and it works easy for me. 
but I'm trying to convince myself to learn Fusion 360, mostly because I can export it into do CFD analysis. OpenSCAD has become amazingly useful because it has great libraries for designing thin cans and recovery systems and transitions and nose counts. And those are all available uh, on, Tinger, on uh, Thingiverse. Slicer, I happen to like Simplify 3D. And printers, I've really come to love Dremel, and I'm going to learn my colleagues. Um, I've seen sample parts of John Coker's Mark Forged in uh, carbon fiber impregnated nylon, and they are really, really elegant. So that's my pitch, and I'm happy to go take any questions. Steve, uh, your question about open scan. I I I don't bother too much with the programming. I've adjust some of the scripts, but there's some wonderful pre-gun scripts on Thingiverse. I think they're from Gary Crowell in particular for doing nose cones and fin cans and things like transitions. Wow. I mean, these things I don't have to program. I just fill out the blanks and I can I create um, you know optimized nose cones. I have to be a fan a power series nose cones for transonic flights. And there's no place you can buy those things pre-made. Here I can make my own. Yeah, Fusion 360 is going to have to be um, really on my list. But, you know, uh, as you can see, I'm not in a lack of things to do. Uh, finishing tips. You know, I have to admit that for me, I'm just bad at finishing. Uh, painting is not my skill set. So um, I like I like playing with the aerodynamics. Ah, Q and A. Thank you. Let me look there. Um, shrink. The first question is from Larry. Methods for dealing with shrinkage. I'm finding that the best thing for shrinkage is I was getting odd sizing when I was my first printer in PLA. And I found that I went to my better printer in Dremel, which has a very more consistent heating method. Plus, I've gone to PETG and nylon, and I found that I don't have much shrinkage at all. I think it's the quality of the filament and the quality of the uh, is a big deal. Um, I'm finding epoxy is my best uh, adhesive. Um, I haven't flown the 54 millimeter L yet because COVID. Uh, as I mentioned, Pet G has a deformation temperature that is um, greater than fiber, uh, the epoxy resin we use in our nose cones. So I, and frankly, I've flown stuff to Mach 3.5. I just don't think, I think it's a lot of, um, uh, I think we, we overhype the temperature issue. I'm going to be measuring it. I'll have a third, I have a, I'm putting a thermocouple in the tip of the nose, and so we'll find out uh, that. Gary, thank you so much. You got you have done a great job. Uh, I love your your set of open scads, and they're just wonderful. They've changed my life. Uh, adhesive. I'm using epoxy at the moment, though I have used for some of the small stuff. Um, CA. Uh, um, there's a question here about the Saturn V launch tower. Uh, I haven't done the umbilical tower, but what I've discovered is when doing very detailed parts, the resolution of the printer doesn't tend to be very good. So you got to 
I'm anything with feature size under a millimeter um, gets kind of iffy in my mind. So I would that's the piece I would watch when you're doing very detailed objects like a like a uh, launch tower. Uh, I'll be honest. I have um, I've looked at the surface nylon and pet G are just not nice to sand. Um, and I haven't painted any, so I don't know. Maybe some of our other colleagues in the group here can add to that. But I found that the surface finish on my Dremel printer with both PETG and nylon is satisfactory that I don't feel like I need to sand them. I think uh, how strong the fins are typically with respect to resisting cracking, it's all about the question of what materials you use and what the design is. So for example, on that 54 millimeter, uh, I'm using, I think it's Gary's uh, uh, FinCan uh, open SCAD library. Right? And the design of it gives an interior structure that's really quite strong. And you can adjust how thick you want the fins and, um, and then picking the right material. So I think if you do it in PET G or in nylon, particularly nylon, the fins will be really almost indestructible. I, I, I think the fins on that will, will land on rock and I won't have a problem. Uh, the pocket cubes, uh, golly, 50 Gs on the pocket cubes. But on a typical, you know, on, on an Arliss launch, it typically is under 10 G. We try to, we, we've characterized the Arliss flights so that they are roughly the same flight profile as an orbit class. And that's generally under 10 G. Um, Mark Bundick, yes, the Flyaway is available on Thingiverse. Um, it's a couple of versions. I would look for the latest version there. And I can send you, Mark, I can send you a link uh, out of bounds if you want to. Resin 3D printers. Um, I've done nothing with resin 3D printers, so I think it's a different. Um, resin 3D printers are really, really good when you have fine detail. So if you're looking to build a good scale model, of one of these rockets that needs fine detail, uh, that's where resin 3D printers really shine. My focus has really been on flying fast as high as I can, and then I'm looking at strength and heat resistance. And therefore, the uh, fusion deposition modeling has been the, 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 the best idea. Uh, let's see, got some new ones. HPRB, how about a 3D printed fin can? I would do it. Um, I don't, I, frankly, after doing this, I would never, well, not never. Um, for an L1, I would certainly do it. And I would, I recommend it. I have a team of high school students that are all going for their L1s over the summer. And we're going to 3D print the, the cert can, the fin cans. Um, the only place I would be cautious right now is that, for example, our Arliss Extreme, which is a Mach 3 class, um, their uh, a, a carbon fiber multi-layer composite vacuum bagged, I think is still the standard. But that's where I'm hoping that these new thin cans made out of um, continuous carbon fiber impregnated nylon could be amazing. Um, Guy. Experience with polycarbonate 3D printing. My only experience with polycarbonate, I've tried to print a little bit. My printer really doesn't seem to like it very much at the moment. It needs a stainless steel print nozzle because the polycarbonate is very abrasive. I had a TARC team uh, a, a, a year or two ago that were seventh graders and their dad was a geek and he had a polycarbonate capable printer and they printed as seventh graders, their complete airframe out of polycarbonate. It was heavy. They were not going to be competitive in the competition because they printed too much. But it was very impressive that they had printed the entire thing. Uh, ceramic, you know, I think I think that we're the next big entry point is very high performance on airframes, but also can we print 3D motors? 
I mean, Cicerone propellant is a thermoplastic. In principle, it can be 3D printed, which means that you could then 3D print it in a nylon enclosure, and you could print it with a uh, uh, ceramic filament. I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a personal motor guy, but I think it's very, very likely that that's going to be able to be possible in not, in not too long a time. Yes, uh, Jeff, your question about the best way to create real scale V2. I, I didn't show it, but I've had a, I have a small V2 that is um, thinks like it has much better fins. Um, also, I want to uh, raise this point. One of my personal beliefs is that um, a slab fin, like either on a piece of wood or a um, um, piece of fiberglass is not the strongest fin shape. Because particularly going transonic, I believe that you get sympathetic vibration inside the fin and it gets reflected inside the fin because of its, its, of its symmetry. And that I think it makes it weaker. And I think that this causes fins to get ripped off just as you go through max cube. So I am a fan of thinking of asymmetric fins that are thicker at the root than at the tip and the leading edge and trailing edge, and that essentially damp vibrations inside the fin. So all of the fin cans that I'm building for high performance are all asymmetric. I think that adds to their strength rather than takes away their strength. Uh, Paul, what type of filaments? Um, one of the downsides of the Dremel a printer is that it takes kind of a non-standard um, filament roll, and so they make money off of selling filaments in their size um, that are a bit more expensive than fil the cheapest filaments you can get. So, uh, on the other hand, I have tremendous success with them. So they have filaments for uh, PLA for what they call um, ABS plus, which is actually a kind of a super enhanced PLA, and a PET G and a nylon. Their PET G and nylon is superb, and I have great success with them. Um, for cost reasons, I've also tried to move towards Hatchbox, and the Hatchbox translucent uh, PET G has been very successful. The colored ones, not so much. So let's see what else I might ramble on with for the last couple of minutes here. Uh, let's see. Anyway, I'm I'm a convert, and most of my my student teams are converts, and um, I think we're at the edge of being able to go much faster. Um, I'm pretty convinced that this will work great as uh, yeah, someone just recommended here uh, atomic filaments. I haven't tried them, um, and I think that's something I'm gonna. I'm now experimenting with the PET GCF, so that's something to go try. I'll try. As soon as you start getting into these more exotic filaments like carbon fiber embedded PET G, the price goes up, and so um, those get more expensive. Um, Bob. Uh, someone asked a question about minimum diameter rackets and motor retention. Uh, I think it's going to work great. Uh, I have not yet flown an extreme minimum diameter, but the uh, I have several different designs for motor retention. There's a great Thingiverse. Um, Design for 29 millimeter uh, screw on things that I've scaled up to 54 and down to 13. Um, and I think that's a little bulky at 54, so I haven't used that here. But I think it will pass the strength and temperature uh, constraints fine, particularly 
Uh, I've flown, I don't know, maybe 10 flights now with HPR motors, and uh, they seem to have all survived quite well. How many, there's a question here about how many shells do you use for your smaller LPR rocket tubes? Uh, I think you're, you're talking about um, how many layers inside. Um, uh, I'm using, to an extent, what the default is for the slicer. And I think for my slicer, for PET G, the number of outer walls is set to B3. So I think that I think that's what your question is about shells. Do you use for a smaller LPR rocket tube? Jeff Fisher asks about um, without printers. Yes, you can. You can get third parties that will print for you. I have not used them, so I don't quite know what their prices are. Um, I, I think you have to try. I would, I would try them with a small design and see if you're satisfied. Um, but you may also find some of your friends that may have a printer like I do and will do the printing for you. They may want to look around the community as well, the rocketry community, those guys, your club or remote places, um, you know, as a way to get started to try those out. And there's, there's way lots of expertise on consulting on materials, lots of opinions. I find that, I, in my experience, there's a lot of work doing exploration of finding the right slicing combinations, the right designs, and the right printer. Yeah, Larry just mentioned makerspaces. A makerspace is a great idea for getting 3D printers. Um, though, again, I think it's for rocketry, it's important to get a 3D printer that can print the right materials, not just PLA. PLA is a place to start, and I think it's okay for LPR. But as soon as you got out of LPR space, I really think you need a printer that can print um, with PETG, and PETG in particular is, you know, really important. Um, Guy asks about, elaborate a bit more about printer resolution. Um, I found that, first of all, I'm not much of a scale guy. So uh, I find that on some of the models I've done, you can see my collection of little Mercury and those things I made. When they scale down, they lose resolution and the printer really loses the ability to do it. Um, as I said, I, I would be cautious about features that are kind of less than a half a millimeter. Um, and that's the, the resolution where you really need to think about a resin printer rather than and resin printers can do very fine detail. And again, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I would think about that if you're deeply into scale. We talked about fins, Gs, resin printers. Okay, I think I've got through all the, all the questions. And I think we're just at the limits of we're going to be at 1250. So uh, thank you very much all for listening and joining me, and thank you for your great comments and questions. Um, I hope you guys are all having fun with uh, 3D printing. And um, if you aren't, you should be. And um, uh, contact me via email. I'll be happy to answer any other questions or share any of the stuff that I can, uh, links to the um, to uh, content or uh, other stuff. So unless there's any questions, I'm going to go stop.
and you guys can go go on to the next one. Uh, Dan Bates. I've looked at them. I haven't bought any yet from Boyce Aerospace Hobbies. Um, it looks to me like he's doing some good stuff. Um, it looks to me like they're printed on a FDM printer. So I don't know about the detail that you would see on a resin printer, but again, I haven't looked at it in detail. But I, I think he's got a great idea for a business in that for those of us that don't have printers, using printers to get, make a wide collection of more rarely um, available objects is really cool. Um, so I see my quick look at him, he had things like nose cones and particularly for scale, different kinds of scale models that I, that, you know, are not available. So essentially uh, he does a great job of filling that gap. Uh, uh, Okay, five. Up. Well, David, I hear your question about uh, being interested, but you know I'm seventy. I don't know about how old you are. We can go. We can go play age games. But um, actually, I think it, the tools right now are really good, and particularly, I would go look at think, uh, Thingiverse. Look at what can be built. Go scroll through the rocketry, do a search on rocketry projects. And um, there's amazing stuff that you can download and use as a basis to start. A tool like Tinkercad is really kind of easy to use. And so the learning curve for those kind of tools isn't that hard. And so I would suggest it. Check it out, you know. Okay. I'm going to stop. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Enjoy.